Our speaker is Dr. Bruce Ballinger, a professor of English and former department chair at Boise State University, where he specializes in composition theory, inquiry-based learning, and creative nonfiction. He's the author of seven books, including uh, the best-selling textbooks, The Curious Writer and The Curious Researcher, all published by Pearson. He's published more than 30 articles and essays in publications ranging from River Teeth, a journal of narrative nonfiction, to College English. His new book, Crafting Truth, Short Stories in Creative Nonfiction, uh, was published last year. And I think um, Bruce will be talking about writing creative nonfiction um, on our conference uh, for literature and creative writing uh, tomorrow. But today his session is titled, You Can't Sling No Bull, Teaching the Audio Essay. Bruce, are you ready to begin? Hello. I'm here. Can Hi, you hear me? Great. We can hear you. I'm going to turn it over to you. OK. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm grateful to Pearson for this opportunity to talk about today to talk about the audio essay, and grateful um, more generally for their um, uh, sponsorship of these of these online conferences and I think it's really great with department budgets um, being so tight to have this opportunity to to talk to people uh, and to share uh, information about our teaching I dropped in a few times this morning listening to some of the other speakers and it was just some extraordinarily good um, information so let me um, let me I'm gonna this is going to be quite informal. Um, I'm going to. I've got a bunch of slides to to share with you about teaching the audio audio essay. Uh, I want to leave a significant amount of time at the end of the talk to have a conversation with you because I suspect that I'm not the only one out there who's discovered either the podcast or the audio essay, depending on what you want to call it, as a really useful teaching tool and not just in a creative nonfiction class or advanced writing class, but also in first year writing. Um, I stumbled on the audio essay largely by accident. Um, like a lot of my friends, I became addicted to programs like uh, This American Life, and um, at the same time discovered that there was a uh, the availability of uh, audio software uh, to do recording in class um, increased significantly, and it made it. And, and, and essentially, there there was free software out there that students could use. I also was lucky enough one semester to um, to teach a class in a computer lab. Um, how are we doing? You see my screen now? Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Oh, okay. Um, I was lucky enough to teach in a uh, computer lab, and so I also had the opportunity to, you know, the technology was available to actually do this kind of recording. Um, so I, about seven or, seven or eight years ago, I started teaching the, the, what I call the radio essay, modeled largely after the kinds of things that we hear on the radio from the kind of voice-only work that you get in this, I believe, to the more complicated uh, work with multiple tracks that involve music and voice, ambient sound, interview clips that are typical of the kind of This American Life documentary. And today I want to talk about um, the ways in which teaching the radio essay has um, kind of revolutionized my approach to teaching writing. Um, and it's not because what I discovered was that this was a genre that students uh, needed to learn, and that's not necessarily what I think. Um, what I discovered, as you'll see as this talk unfolds, is that all of the things that I've wanted to teach uh, for years suddenly became more powerful and easier, in fact, by teaching the kind of embodied writing, uh, the writing that involves the writer's voice, literally. Uh, and so I'd like to, I'll share with you some of the things that I discovered. And, and one of the things that I was determined to do today was to um, not talk so much and, in fact, let my students speak for themselves. Uh, and so I've, hopefully this will work. I've embedded a bunch of video, uh, audio from my students in this slideshow uh, 
PowerPoint presentation so that you can hear in their own words uh, the kind of thing that, um, that they learned or did not learn by uh, doing the audio essay. So I, I hopefully that will be a, a really good way to convince you that this is the kind of thing that you should try. I want to say something about the title. You can't sling no bull. Um, let me just, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Um, let me just move this around here. Um, I had this really interesting moment one time in class. I was teaching the audio essay. It was about, it was the end of the semester. I think this is the second time I tried it. Uh, I was still learning how to do it. Uh, um, but I could tell that uh, the students had really enjoyed the experience and part of what I did, started to do routinely, is I started to interview them at the end of the class, often with a, a microphone about their experience. And I have a student named Jeff uh, who, who wrote this in his reflective letter. He said, before this class I was a self-labeled bullslinger. I wrote what I was expected to write, what my professors wanted to hear, and I got good marks for it. Audio, however, is much more personal. You can tell when a person doesn't believe what they're saying, and even more so when they do. This was a theme that was repeated uh, and has been repeated over and over again in every, every class that I've taught with the audio essay. That is, the students, in this case, this is a student who was at the end of his career as a, as a college student who'd written many papers, including lots in his English classes in all kinds of genres, had felt like he'd spent all of the time, in writing at least, slinging bull. And one of the things that the radio essay did for him was call him out on that. Um, and I found this amazingly consistent, that students who uh, often felt that they were constricted and confined by academic writing, didn't understand how that kind of writing could be voiceful, realized, in fact, that they had been slinging bull for years, could not do it when asked to record their voices, to record their essays, to say their essays. And I thought this, this was just fascinating and really powerful. And so I have spent a considerable amount of time trying to figure out why that is. Um, but even if I never figure it out, the idea that students can go to a genre like this one and can be challenged to be um, honest and to care about what they say in writing is a lesson that I've been trying to teach for years and years and have not found a better way to do it. Um, let me just move on here a little bit um, just to address the general question of, of um, why this is an approach that you might want to consider. And these are the four main reasons that, uh, that drew me to the to audio genres, to sound projects. Uh, the first I mentioned already, and that is that the technology uh, to do this is relatively simple and very accessible. I'll show you later. I've many, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with free software on the web that allows students to uh, record and edit audio recordings, and Audacity is uh, probably the most popular um, and best free software that students can download on their computers or can be downloaded for free in computer labs. Um, and it's not particularly difficult to use, um, and um, everyone can get it, and so suddenly it became possible uh, with the addition of a microphone and a few other things to do this without much difficulty. The technology was not an obstacle anymore. Um, audio essays, I think, also invoke multiple literacies. And let me mention just uh, one thing that uh, I learn tremendous. I, I learn every time from my students is uh, they, they are incredibly literate in music. And I thought I was kind of too, but my students have demonstrated to me, and I'm sure I shouldn't have been surprised, um, how incredibly knowledgeable they are about music and how enthusiastic they are about music. Now, of course, they had never imagined that music and writing could be joined. But in several of our projects, and particularly the narrative and documentary projects I'll talk about later, students were able to combine music with their voices 
with their essays in ways that um, just continued to astonish me. And not only did I learn about some music that I was unaware of, but the students, we all learned the ways in which um, the music can be a form of punctuation in writing, uh, in audio writing anyway. And so the, the, I think the students really discovered along with me the ways in which these literacies that they bring to class beyond their years of experience as writers can be relevant to creating informative and moving projects. And I, I love that about it. Student engagement is obviously another thing, and I want to um, talk about that specifically uh, in a second. But um, I'll just reiterate that um, the reason I keep returning to teaching the audio essay and various forms of audio essays is that it teaches the things I've been trying to teach all of my career more, effect more effectively than anything I've ever tried. And again, it's not, I'm not drawn to these genres because I want to teach the technology. Uh, I'm actually not very good at the technology uh, relative to some of my students. But what they learn about writing is the thing that I think is most powerful. And I'll try to talk specifically about what things they learn. Um, so here's a, let's listen to a student who addresses the, uh, the issue of student engagement, which I think is um, you know, a really powerful uh, aspect of, of this kind of pedagogy. So this is a student I've had several times um, in several classes named Andre, who's not a graduate student with us, actually, um, and who later came to um, just be exceptionally good at producing these essays. So let's take a look at what she says about uh, being in a class in which they are, the students are asked to write audio essays. Uh, Bruce, Bruce? You're not hearing the audio. Are you hearing it on your end? I am. You're not hearing the audio? No. Oh, darn. No. Bruce, uh, perhaps um, try to put the, uh, yep. maybe try to put the receiver next to the speaker. That may help. Okay. All right. We'll try that. Hello. Hey, Bruce. Yeah, I, I don't think that, okay. I don't know that that audio component's going to work with this um, Citrix webinar server. I'm sorry. Well, darn. I know. Right. So I'll just proceed. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Bruce. <laughs> All right. Apparently, can, am I back online? Yeah, Hello. you're, you're yeah. all set, Bruce. Okay, great, thanks. Um, really bummed that the audio is not going to work here because the students really had a lot of interesting things to say. Um, anyway, uh, another time we'll figure out how to do this. Basically what Andrea said was um, that the students were deeply engaged in these projects. And I think one of the things that struck me at the end of the semester is uh, in my final uh, interviews with them about the class, uh, I was stunned at how much time they had spent on these projects. Uh, the, one of the three projects that I teach is this, uh, um, it's a documentary project, and uh, my students told me that they would spend um, 
between 12 and uh, 18 hours working on these projects, uh, incredibly time consuming. They were highly motivated to get them right. And I was just, I don't think I'd ever made an assignment, given an assignment that had that kind of level of involvement. So it was really, it was really great. Um, so let's just move on here. And because, um, because the audio is not working, um, I won't be able to share with you the, uh, this is the ending of a documentary that one of my students did uh, who served in Iraq uh, in which he talked about uh, what he called the burn pit, which is a place in which um, the service people would um, essentially burn anything they weren't used. And it was an, uh, just a really powerful and moving essay about um, the kind of waste uh, that is involved in war. Uh, the title of his essay was called The Smoke of Empire. Uh, and I think for him it was an incredibly uh, moving experience to make the piece and to reflect on his service over in Iraq. Uh, and unfortunately, I won't be able to share it with you. Let me just talk, uh, and I had a student here talking about this Bruce? as well. But let, yeah. Actually, let's try one more thing. Um, okay. The microphone which you're currently speaking into, mm -hmm. could you try putting that next to the speaker and turning everything all the way up? Okay, I'll have to unplug the micro. Well, I'll have to, yeah. The, the problem is with the microphone or it plugged into the computer, the speakers are silent. Oh, okay. But isn't that true? Let me say. Let me just see. Hold on for a second. Let me try this. Okay. Is everyone enjoying this chaos? <laughs> <laughs> it's very real world. Yeah, not coming out. Not okay. coming out of the speakers. So I'd have to mm. unplug my uh, microphone and then replug it back in to talk again. Hmm. You I know remember what, Bruce, I, had I have a. Go ahead, jump in. Yeah. Oh no, no, I was just saying that it had worked during the practice, but that's okay. We could just keep going as planned. Okay. And Bruce, Bruce, yeah. I have a copy of your PowerPoint, so I wonder if, um, if you don't mind. Um, me distributing it, maybe um, the people who are, uh, the many, many people who are writing in and saying they wish they could hear it, maybe they could, uh, I can give my email address at the end of your session and they can email me and I will send them a copy of your PowerPoint if you don't, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Great idea. Okay. Okay. That's it, what we'll do then. At the, uh, at the end, I'll go ahead and give you all my email address and you can write to me and I will send you um, Bruce's PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Well, okay. I apologize, ahead, everybody. Bruce. <laughs> um, it will leave a bit more time for questions in this conversation, which would be great. So uh, I had a student here who was talking about the experience of dealing with the rhetorical situation of the audio essay. And, um, and I think this is one of the main reasons this is such a powerful pedagogy. Uh, I made it very clear to my students when I teach this that this is the situation. They have several minutes in, some, in, in several of the assignments to read their essays. They have considerably less than that, perhaps 10 seconds, to engage their listeners. But even more challenging, they should assume that their listeners will only hear this piece once. Now the pressure that puts on the pros uh, is considerable. You know, the, the, all of the qualities that we admire about good writing, or many of the qualities we admire about good writing, conciseness, clarity, um, um, clear intention, matters tremendously in a rhetorical situation like this when um, a listener slash reader will only get to hear a piece once and is easily distracted. And the students, I think, in this rhetorical uh, situation responded really uh, well to that. I mean, it was a very real situation to them. And um, in the recording, you would have heard a, a student talking about um, how difficult that was, but also how motivating it was, and how much it changed her writing. Um, I've already mentioned this a little bit, uh, and I think one of the powerful 
experiences student have, students have is that when they read their essays, uh, the work is literally embodied. Uh, we talk a lot about voice in um, composition pedagogy. And I think, generally speaking, students understand more or less what that means, although those of us who are theorists have complicated that um, considerably. But um, they, they do get voice, and I'm always amazed uh, how well they get it, given how complicated I think it is. But one of the things about the radio essay is that it makes this very simple. The writing is, their own prose is issuing literally from their own bodies. And this is something that they're acutely aware of. I don't need to talk about this. They recognize it immediately. And I think this is one of the reasons that students feel that they have to tell the truth, that students feel that um, what they say has to be meaningful to them because it's coming literally from all of them. And I think this is just an incredibly powerful thing and something I've been trying to teach for years as a writing teacher in text-only genres uh, that students get in a, in a really significant way right away in, this, in these genres. Um, SOFT, in case you don't know, is, my, is an acronym that I borrowed from my friend and old friend and mentor, the late Donald Murray, who, um, who used to laminate sayings that he was fond of um, for his friends, and one of these was uh, this acronym SOFT, S-O-F-T, which stands for Say One Fricking Thing. Um, this is one of those acronyms, acronyms that my students never forget once I share it with them. Uh, and you know, this, this is a very simple way of saying that every piece of writing should be organized around one idea, one dominant meaning. meaning. Um, and we can call that a thesis, we can call that a um, main point, we can call that the main theme, we can call that the center of gravity, we can call it any number of things, but, but typically, particularly um, short writing um, needs to have some kind of central idea around or question around which it's organized. And this in the radio essay becomes even more important. And so I would, in the, in the audio recording, I, I think this is a, a student who talks about how my first draft was missing a soft. Now, gee, I wish I could, um, I wish I would have more moments like that in a, in a workshop where students would look at each other and say, you know, like, where's your main theme or, you know, um, they don't, they don't necessarily automatically ask that question about unity. But in these genres, they do. You know, the, I just would frequently say, there's no soft here. What's the soft? And you know, because, these, because of the rhetorical situation, you ha the intention of the writer, the, the meaning of the writer, has to be made utterly clear, and in fact, may even need to be repeated. Uh, and so students, I think, learn this very fundamental principle of organizing their writing around a controlling idea much more powerfully in these genres than they did in any other thing I've tried. I think I've mentioned this already that uh, the students, um, given the rhetorical situation, feel, um, understand that conciseness and clarity is even more important than in anything they've, they've ever written. Uh, that, that's what they report. And uh, you know, here's a quotation. Fortunately, we don't have to listen to this because it's, I wrote it down. It's not an audio problem, but um, this was a this was a comment that was repeated uh, time and time again when I interviewed students at the end of the class. In creating these simple simpler sentences that work to convey a point sooner and more clearly, I found that my writing became more pure in a sense. There was no dancing around the subject or lengthy flowery descriptions that could trigger disinterest in a liter in, a, in a listener. And I found this pretty consistently. Uh, in the past, when I would have uh, editing workshops, we'd focus on sentence-level concerns. Um, I had a, I, it was always a challenge, I think, to get students to trim away material, to work towards um, conciseness. And I think one of the things that happened in 
this project is that uh, I didn't need to say much about that, that students immediately understood that in a uh, two-minute radio essay, every word had to count. Again, this is a, those of you who get the PowerPoint slides uh, from Amy, uh, I hope we'll listen to a snippet from this radio documentary that was done by my students, one of my students last, uh, I guess last spring. Um, she did a really moving documentary about uh, being a Japanese American, and this is a photograph of the internment camp here in Idaho to which her grandparents were sent. And one of the interviews that, uh, the clips that I was going to share with you was her interview with her 93-year-old grandfather uh, about his experience there. Uh, and he, of course you can imagine uh, how powerful an experience it is for a student writer to um, find stories in their families that they had never heard and then find a way to share them with other people. And I think um, Katie, who did this, it just uh, did a remarkable job. The entire document, I think, was the best documentary that my students did uh, last semester. So let me get down to the pedagogy a little bit. Um, and I hope in our Q&A we can talk a little more about the kinds of things that you guys have done with podcasts or audio essays. But I'll describe to you basically how my course was designed. Now, I should tell you that this um, I've done pieces of these assignments in my first year writing classes. Uh, this, these assignments were in, in um, my 200 and 400 level writing classes. Uh, again, I think they can work w without any difficulty as well in first year writing, but um, this was the course I designed for students who were 200 and 400 level students. So there were three major assignments, and they built on each other in terms of complexity. The first assignment was a commentary, uh, which was it is, it is a very simple project in some ways. It's a it's a voice only project. So students were asked to write an audio essay using only their voice that ran three minutes or less. They found this excruciating because that's two and a half manuscript pages. Uh, the pressure for conciseness was uh, tremendous and they struggled mightily with the length of these pieces. It was a great way to start as well because the students got a chance to uh, work with the audio software. We used Audacity, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, and kind of learn their way uh, with that software. And because it was only one track, there wasn't a, there wasn't a whole lot of editing involved, and uh, so this was a really good starting project. Second project was what I'm calling the narrative, and again, these these could be on any topic. Um, the narrative essay combined voice and music, so it had two separate tracks. This was uh, somewhat more complicated. Students had to struggle with. Um, not only writing a strong audio essay, one that is purposeful, concise, lively, um, and relevant to their listeners, but also had to figure out how to use music uh, in the story they were telling. And this became more, uh, somewhat more challenging with the technology, but their level of motivation went way up because suddenly they were drawing on this other literacy that they thought had really very little to do with writing, and that is, of course, uh, their knowledge and understanding of music. Uh, and then the final project was a very difficult one, a uh, complicated one, but the one that the students uh, enjoyed the most, and that was this documentary project. Uh, I mentioned one example of that uh, just a second ago when I talked to you about Katie's uh, piece on her, uh, on being Japanese American here in the West. And the documentary project involved three or four audio tracks. The voice of the narrator, of course, is the writer herself. The um, music, um, sometimes ambient noise, uh, car doors opening and closing, um, and then uh, interview clips, and always involved interview clips. 
students would write about a whole range of things in the documentary, and of course, it meant that they went out into the world with their microphones and talked to people. The documentary project, as I said, is enormously time consuming, but students found it uh, enormously record, uh, re uh, rewarding. And in the end of the class, I think typically students were much more likely to include the documentary in their portfolio than the commentary, for example. They got um, really excited about what that could do. Let me just talk about the technology very quickly because I want to start to wrap up here. Um, uh, Audacity is uh, the software that we used. A lot of computers come with audio software. Macs, for example, come uh, with GarageBand, which is I've not used very much, but it's a very good uh, program to use. Audacity is free. It can be downloaded from the internet. Um, and so uh, that's the URL for the Audacity site. You can wander around there and take a look at it. I will just give you um, one footnote about Audacity. Um, when it has multiple tracks, it tends to crash sometimes, which drives everyone absolutely nuts. Uh, hopefully, they'll work on that. Um, and in addition, you want to work with Audacity produces uh, wave files, which are really big files. And generally speaking, with sound projects in a writing class, you want to work with MP3 files. Now, Audacity will produce convert into MP3, but it requires uh, an add-in that you can find on their site. They'll explain how it works, but the students struggle with that, uh, at least initially. So you may need to kind of bone up on how to make sure that you're working with MP3 and not Audacity or WAV files. Here's an example of what an Audacity file looks like. This is uh, last semester, Erin Morris's, uh, this was her narrative essay. Um, and it just gives you this, this is the, the interface of Audacity. Here's the audio file. And you can um, zoom in and zoom out. It becomes very easy to take out um, clips and um, to manipulate them. I obviously won't go into any, any detail there. I do have, for those of you who are interested, um, I'll put together some resources on this. I do have a just outstanding handout produced by our technology department on um, how for intermediate users uh, and how to manipulate files in ways that are really relevant to the kind of projects we're talking about. All right. I want to wrap up a little bit with um, talking about variations on my three big projects. These, of course, uh, the com commentary, narrative, and documentary are, are significant projects, uh, increasingly time consuming from the first to the last. But I've done a lot of other things. Um, for example, in a class, I've instead of having a, uh, a, a final paper, I'll have students submit a final audio podcast. I've done that in a number of classes. Um, these tend not to have uh, multiple tracks. They tend to be voice only. But um, I've also, um, there's, there's a considerable number of audio files interesting ones on the web. I mentioned one here, the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. For years I've taught the profile as a text-only genre. And uh, one of the things I've started to experiment with lately is to um, have students go to a site like the Veterans History Project, which has audio files and, and interviews from uh, veterans from our wars from World War II to, uh, through Vietnam, and then to build profiles using those files. Um, and I think they can be really powerful audio essays that use the living voice, use the real voices of veterans who experienced either a particular battle or um, served in a particular um, location during one of the wars. And um, so that's another area that I'm beginning to experiment with that I think is really promising. And then finally, I just want to mention that um, I, I've often, one of my major interests has always been teaching research-based writing. And I'm now beginning to see that one alternative to the conventional research print text-only research essay um, would be the kind of documentary essay that I've been teaching um, to my students in their sound projects. These are, in fact, research-based essays, uh, except you tend to use the voices 
rather of their, your, your subjects rather than uh, quotations. And I think um, it's a really powerful way to teach some of the same skills we want to teach uh, when we teach students research-based writing. So I think that's a good way to, I can say more about some of these other projects, but um, I think that's a, a good quick overview of the kinds of things that I do. Um, I'd be happy to move to just talking about how people have used this or questions that folks have. All right, well, um, the first question we have is from uh, Lee Hall, and she's wondering um, how much time do you think a student should expect to spend on these projects? And uh, do you have an issue with students becoming overwhelmed with the technological aspect of the project and not finishing the assignment? Well, that's a great question, and I think it's a, it's a good question. Um, I would say the commentary assignment, which is a, a voice-only project, is not particularly time consuming. The level of understanding that students need to do a simple sound project with just their voice is, um, is pretty low. It's, not, it's really not that hard to do. And students tend not to struggle too much with the technology with the simpler assignments. Um, the narrative and documentary assignments, and particularly the documentary assignments, can be very time consuming. The documentary assignment involves, of course, um, figuring out what the story is, um, because like any reporting project, basically, students have to go out and listen to what people say. They may have an idea of what they want to do when they start. And then that usually changes the story, because they have to build the project around what people actually say about their subject, about internment or about working at a tech company. Um, the narrative piece uh, can be very time consuming because, uh, not because the technology is that challenging, but because students get uh, kind of obsessed with some of the music stuff. Um, they probably spend a little more time on that because they love it so much. But I have not had difficulty with students not completing the assignments. Um, in my first year writing class, when I do a sound project, it will be a much more limited one. It'll usually just be a voice only project. Um, I haven't tried the more complicated narrative and documentary projects, although I'm anxious to do so. Um, we had a, a question about um, Jing and um, Extra Normal. Sharon Muldoon is wondering if you've used um, either of those uh, screencasting technologies in your class and what your experience has been like with those. I haven't. I'd like to. I'd like to learn more about it. I have no experience with it at all. I'm taking notes, though. <laughs> Jing is Jing's actually pretty fun. I haven't used Extra Normal, but um, oh, I have used Jing like a little Jing. bit, but yeah, yeah not much. Let's see, there was a question about whether or not you do you request um, written versions um, of the script when they turn things in, or kind of. I think maybe there are, some, there are some questions here kind of getting at um, how you do the grading. Do you just kind of submit comments to them, or do you have a copy of the written script and you make comments on that, or what are some of the nuts and bolts there? Yeah, so for the first two projects, the commentary and the narrative projects, um, I, request, uh, I request drafts, written drafts, text-only dra drafts, as I would any other writing assignment. And so um, I will uh, respond and evaluate. We'll workshop those pieces as well in class. And um, the documentary project is a little different. Uh, instead of asking for a draft, I usually have students begin to construct storyboards um, like one would do in a documentary, film documentary. Uh, and again, these storyboards um, you know, essentially give give me a sense of how the story, how the story might go together in, in a very general sense, and then they build their narration around that. And with the documentary, um, the narration is, is so fluid that I've not tended to ask for sort of complete um, drafts of the, of the narration. Um, I sometimes ask for pieces of it, like the, the an intro, um, but with the other two projects, yes, I get I get drafts like I normally would, and we workshop them like we normally would, and we'll listen to uh, some This American Life uh, 
pieces, segments that are similar so that they can get a sense of the ways in which uh, the writing for radio is somewhat different than writing for uh, in text only. Uh, and that those kinds of things will you know, inform their conversation about the, about the, the uh, drafts. Okay. That, um, that kind of leads into a, a question about um, Darlene Proctor's uh, hoping you could talk a little bit about the uh, this, I believe, um, project that you had listed among your audio projects. Yeah, you know, this is not one that um, that I personally use, but uh, several uh, folks here and elsewhere that I've talked to about the sound projects um, have used this as an assignment. It's it's not, unfortunately not it, it, like a lot of my ideas is not original with me at all. In fact, a lot of writing teachers around the country, I think, have used the this, I believe, format um, as uh, the basis of an assignment. And of course, I think most of you know that the this, I believe, is a um, radio program that was started by Edward R. Murrow um, many years ago uh, and was continued on NPR and, and I think went kind of offline for a while, but it's now back up on the web. Um, and it invites submissions uh, from people around the country, including students, uh, to talk about some issue uh, of value that's very important to them. And these essays can be very powerful. And they're very difficult to write. And um, though I haven't used the assignment, it seems um, like a wonderful project that would involve uh, this audio uh, component. They are, after all, radio essays, and so um, I'm going to try it next time. <laughs> Great. We had uh, probably just, uh, probably don't have time for much more, but um, I'm going to go ahead and send you the, the rest of the questions, but um, Michael Michaud uh, mentioned that you mentioned a, a document that your IT people created to introduce mm -hmm. intermediate level users to Audacity. Yes. Um, do you, could we get access to that? Could you send it to me and I could send it to people? Or do you have another resource that, um, that you would recommend? Um, I have, I guess, uh, no, yeah, I will ha I'd be happy to send that to you and I'm sure our IT folks um, are not at all proprietary about it and it's really quite good. Um, and I am also in the process of putting up or finishing a, a, a list of resources that uh, folks, uh, books and web sources that folks might want to look at if they're thinking about trying some of these projects, and I'll send that along too. Oh, that would be great, Bruce. And I, um, I just posted my email address as a, a chat message to the entire audience, um, so you should be able to see it um, if you expand the chat menu over there on the right side of your screen. Um, but if you can't, um, I'll just give it to you as an audio essay. It's um, A as in Apple, I, M as in Mary, double E, dot, B as in boy, E, R as in Robert, G as in George, E, R as in Robert, Amy Berger, at Pearson, P-E-A-R-S-O-N, dot com. And if you email me, I can get you um, Bruce's PowerPoint and any other uh, resources that, um, that we have on Audacity. Um, I have a really good PowerPoint. Um, that I downloaded. There's a there's actually a good um, wiki for it's just called the Audacity Wiki, um, and it has a whole list of resources from Creative Commons. Um, there's a great one on that page um, called I think it's called Audacity for High School Students. It's a sim it's a really simple PowerPoint. Um, I usually take out the for high school students if I distribute it to my <laughs> students, but. Um, it exists as a PDF as well, so if you just do a Google search on Audacity Wiki, um, you'll come you'll come to that. And there's some great resources on that page as well. So, anyway, thanks a lot, Bruce. There are so many um, enthusiastic comments here. I think a lot of people um, are excited to try out some of these assignments, and um, everyone really appreciates your time today. You bet. It was my pleasure, and I'm sorry about the technical problems. Like it was more oh, of my fault about on my end. No, it, it worked fine in rehearsal. It's it's certainly not your fault. So um, thanks for thanks for toughing through that with us. And uh, I guess I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks Amy. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks, Bruce.